So we look ourselves at doing both. Most important what NVIDIA liked is that we're green only. That was really important to, but Bitcoin miners in the US, they don't care if it's coal, uh, they don't care where the sword comes from. But it's interesting in Europe, where we're listed on the German market also, investors there do care. NVIDIA does care. And so we do care. But we run the place, the functionality that we come back to nine time zones are most efficient. And we have the lowest GNA compared to our peers for a Bitcoin mine or per exahash, they like to call it. So we're running a lower six exahash going and climbing. And, and I think that in that growth profile, we will maybe be able to maintain that low GNA, that discipline, like, a, like an ETF money manager is. Hi, Frank. How are you? I'm outstanding. What's up? Uh, where are you now? I'm in San Antonio, Texas. Just flew back fr from Switzerland, attending the Plan B Bitcoin conference. Nice. How was it? It was amazing. The intellectual capital... Some of the original people in the white paper for Bitcoin were there and speaking. Uh, we had Eric Bukanas, who's the leading Bloomberg analyst for ETFs. Uh, he gave an outstanding presentation on the significance of, of uh, ETFs and Bitcoin. Nice, nice. For uh, our audience who uh, uh, are meeting you for the first time, can you please present yourself and... Uh your uh, background and uh, what you're doing? Sure. I'm Frank Holmes. I'm the co-founder and ex, and ex, we call it executive chairman of Hive Digital Technology, the first crypto mining company to go public. I'm also a money manager and I'm the CEO of US Global Investors and we're known for the world of gold and that's what led me down the Bitcoin path and uh, Jets ETF, uh, this is the New York Stock Exchange and throughout Latin America and other ETFs. Okay, so um, it's uh, very interesting when I discuss uh, Bitcoin with uh, gold bugs, like people who come from the gold uh, industry. And when, when did you discover Bitcoin and how did in your head like uh, the switch from uh, gold to digital gold basically happened well that transformation period really started in 2017 and and that sort of epic moment was in may of 2017 and i went to new york city to attend a consensus conference and the keynote speaker was abigail johnson the ceo of fidelity now why would she be at a bitcoin crypto conference uh, she's a CEO of one of the largest fund groups in the world. And she told the story that she thinks the blockchain is going to replace all settlements and that she had been a Bitcoin miner uh, sourcing electricity in Quebec for, for a couple of years. So that was, to me, telling me something big was happening. And, and during that path, I had been trying to launch a Bitcoin ETF. And I realized that it was like driving down a cul-de-sac with the SEC and the Securities Commission in Canada because of the concerns of KYC and AML. But when you're a Bitcoin miner, you mine and you basically create what they call the virgin coin, and there's no KYC or AML problem, and you can put that into a cold wallet, and all of a sudden you have your Bitcoin. So that's what led me down from our ETF business and mutual funds and, and gold funds, et cetera, to pivot over to the creation of the first crypto mining company to go public in September of 2017. Uh, what is interesting is that it was a big success. Uh, I put up the first 5 million, 30 million came behind, went public and Fidelity gave us 100 million for expansion and other institutions and predominantly came out of Quebec uh, that were early investors in the vision of Hive. Okay, it's, I think it's gonna I'm look forward for the discussion because we are both money managers and we both had the idea of launching an ETF. So you went through creating a crypto miner, whether uh, at Milan you went through creating a Bitcoin equities ETFs. Uh, how was the process of creating a Bitcoin miner and uh, listing it, so going public, 
I know that we're, for our ETF, we had, uh, because there is no Bitcoin in our ETF, they're just like equities. But although they were equities, we had like, uh, I think we applied for like six or seven countries in Europe to get our ETF approved. And we only had one uh, regulator who accepted it. And the other ones, because Bitcoin, the name Bitcoin was with it, they didn't uh, accept it. How was the listing process, the creation of the company and the listing process from a regulatory perspective and the hurdles you could, you could have had uh, when creating it? Well, there's it's, it's sweet and sour at the same time. It, the, the sweetness is that it was a raving success. I have a big gold following. I have 100,000 readers in 80 countries, and I publish the, what's called the Investor Alert uh, every Friday. Uh, a lot of gold investors, and they were reluctant to go buy Bitcoin. Uh, so Hive became the proxy for them going into this path of, of Bitcoin. And immediately in Canada, they have the venture exchange, and it's much easier for the formation of speculative capital like they have for gold exploration. And many great companies have come out of that uh, area in, 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 in Canada. I think 80% of, of uh, gold mining finance is done through the Toronto and Vancouver stock exchanges. So they were more accepting of that risk. The difficulty really came from accounting, the accounting board, going after the auditors for auditing, making it difficult. The pressure really comes from bank lobbying and banks are really very much anti anything that is that is crypto. And, and it really doesn't matter. It's basically the blockchain. And that's just the reality of it. And we saw you know, just finally now this year, a Bitcoin ETF was launched in the U.S. and has had incredible success. There's like 20 of them out there. The Grayscale is the, probably the least expensive, 15 basis points. Van X HODL, H-O-D-L. It's also a very attractive uh, way to play it. But when you look at the numbers, it's been the fastest growing thematic ETF group in, in American history has been in the Bitcoin ETF uh, genre. And, and I think that that's just really is significant as more and more predominantly through social media platforms showing the runaway of printing of money, um, the currency debasement. And, and I think that in my journey of getting information, I was most impressed that blockchain was invented in 91. It was invented as a time stamping mechanism for telecom for, for trades. And nothing really happens until you see peer to peer comes out with Napster. So the evolution of Bitcoin is interesting. And then a few years later, the US government comes out with SHA-256 encryption. And some genius says, well, let's put the encryption over top of a smart contract. Let's do it with blockchain and let's do it with peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, so there's no central control mechanism. And that was the creation of Bitcoin. Uh, in 2009, it goes public. But before then, was a, was a technology for the telecom industry called M-PESA, M-capital P-E-S-A. And that technology allowed telecom companies to bank the unbanked all through Africa. So Kenya starts it, and it's amazing because it, it, these poor villages all of a sudden have, they're not able to open a bank account, but now they're able to do banking on their phone. It's 51 million people using it. Uh, it. It basically is much more inclusive. And that's what you saw Bitcoin all of a sudden becoming inclusive. And last week, I was just amazed being at uh, Plan B and learning about you know, the, the significance of the success, this, thing, this unique blockchain product called Tether. And Tether today has... 300 million users. That's on average $4,000 per user. Why is that? Because of the oppression and financial oppression in many emerging countries, like Argentina started in 2002, that no one's allowed to have US dollar bank account. Now, no money currency allowed to have US dollars. The government wants all your US dollars. So Tether relates to that, that people can have a banking system with US dollars. So in the world, you see that U.S. dollar is very significant. 
in the digital realm, Bitcoin is profound as a, as a leader. And in this now more centralized MPESA technology shows the significance of something that's really inclusive outside of the banking system. Uh, and, and that has been really quite phenomenal for me to explore and learn, like every time I go on these events. But coming back to Tether, Tether has 300 million users, so huge. With $120 billion. Basically, it's a money fund, which they ha- don't pay out a dividend because they then would be deemed a security. So they kept, are able to keep the, the interest. People don't care. People in Turkey don't care because the currency fell 25% last year. Brazil, uh, Argentina, uh, Venezuela, I can go with country after country that invest, that people want to have some U.S. dollars for where they can buy products and services and the country's currency is being devalued faster than what they're earning interest on a, on a treasury money fund. So this is profound. This is very significant to grasp. Okay, so uh, you had the ETF idea, you, cre- you created and listed the Hive. Tell us what's the evolution process, because my understanding is you started in Iceland mining and then you moved and now you're expanding into Paraguay. How, how was this crypto mining journey uh, went through? Well, my, my experience from being in Canada originally, where I lived in Toronto, and I was very fortunate and blessed to be able to, my first deal ever worked on was taken Franklin, Nevada public by two great world-class money managers, Seymour Schulich and Pierre Lasson. And, and that idea of, of having a small group of intellectual capital and getting that royalty model is something that was the, the, the creation behind Hive. And the other part was important as a money manager. And you know, is with ETFs, basis points expenses are really important. So I'm proud to say that that we function in nine time zones, five languages, and we are still the most efficient miner. When you look at uh, Anthony Power does a calculation of all of our peers, we show up as being a leader and we have the least amount of dilution. And that's very much how uh, the royalty model functions. Uh, and, and it shows up by having the highest revenue per employee. And when you look at our revenue per employee pushing $6 million, NVIDIA is $3.5 million, Apple is $2.5 million, but we are still higher and more efficient this way. So that was the beginning of the creation of Hive, a royalty model and to only source green energy. So going into Iceland, we became, first of all, mining Ethereum, which is a very highly profitable business. Uh, and then we expanded into Sweden. At one time, we were 6% of the global network of, of Ethereum mining. And that, to me, was an interesting journey because when you're mining Ethereum, you had to use GPU chips. Well, when you use GPU chips, that's like driving a Porsche. When you use ASIC chips, well, that's right, driving a Bronco truck. Uh, mm-hmm. Very big difference. And... Um, and so we developed the skill set. And when we want to upgrade from having 130,000 AMD GPU chips, we went with NVIDIA. And so we were mining uh, Ethereum and you're learning how to mine altcoins and convert to Bitcoin. Uh, and that was the first sort of embracing AI in that pattern. So that allowed us to now to go in the AI business with our NVIDIA chips because you're no longer able to mine Ethereum. They went from what's called proof of work to proof of stake, which Mm. is the worst thing for them ever to do because they lost all these young gamers of the world. Millions of kids that have gaming GPU chips uh, go to bed and they turn on their computers to be able to mine uh, one or they used to be able to mine one or two Ethereum a year. And that was their cash to buy a new computer. Uh, and, and that was my learning curve about you know what was the ecosystem. Today, Bitcoin has 18,000 nodes all over the world. The peer-to-peer functionality is re- incredible. There's no holidays. It functions 24-7. We have a node at, at Hive. Uh, so I've really you know, enjoyed that, that process. But I share with you, it's been very hard to get 100 megawatts of green energy. Uh, what we saw after the invasion of Ukraine by, by Russia was immediately 
un, un, unrelated countries all over the world, energy prices went up. Tariffs went up. Everything became all fearful over energy. And now with the big HBC AI boom taking place, Canada all of a sudden said they wanted to review all new data centers going into Canada. And you saw Sweden put up a tax on all data centers. Uh, the barriers of entry started happening. And it became more difficult to get what's called pure green energy. Um, so we're so excited because today we're about 1% of all Bitcoin mined. And this time next year will be 2% with our expansion into Paraguay, which is right near a big hydroelectricity dam. Oh, okay. So now you're doing uh, 100% Bitcoin mining or you have AI and HPC running uh, in parallel? What's the percentage? Uh... In, Parag in Paraguay, it'll just be ASIC chips at the beginning. But in downtown Sweden and downtown Montreal, we have our GPU chips basically providing functionality where people rent by the hour. It's a much more profitable business. Uh, right now, you might make 10, 12 cents an hour mining with the best uh, ASIC chips with our NVIDIA suite uh, in AI, we make a dollar an hour. It's a huge difference of running a business. So it's throwing off about $800,000 of cash flow a month for us. And we think in a year, uh, it should be up to 50 million. That's where our growth plans are. Uh, we have existing data centers, which are very valuable, that hydroelectricity, which we're converting a portion of them into HPC. And we're buying more and more NVIDIA chips to fill into those areas. But for your listeners, what they have to realize, for simple math, when you're going to Bitcoin mining, it's going to cost you about a million dollars per megawatt. You have to think of that number. That's the cost, the infrastructure build to be able to mine Bitcoin. When you go to offer HPC services, high performance computing using NVIDIA chips, it's $10 million per megawatt. So you have a much bigger upfront cost. The chips are much more expensive on top of that, but you have a much more stable revenues and cash flow model from that, that build out. So we look at ourselves as doing both. Most important, what NVIDIA liked is that we're green only. That was really important too. But Bitcoin miners in the US, they don't care if it's coal. Uh, they don't care where the sword comes from. But it's interesting in Europe, where we're listed on the German market also, uh, invest, investors there do care. NVIDIA does care. And so we do care. But we run the place, the functionality that we come back to nine time zones are most efficient. And we have the lowest GNA compared to our peers for a Bitcoin mine or per exahash, they like to call it. So we're running a little over six exahash going and climbing. And, and I think that um, in that growth profile, we will maybe be able to maintain that low GNA, that discipline, like a, like an ETF money manager is. Okay. And um, I mean, this uh, low GNA, you took it from the gold royalty model because uh, Franco Nevada that you mentioned as an example, like it's a several billion dollar market cap company run by very few people because... At the end, they're just uh, manipulating financial products rather than extracting the gold themselves and doing all the hard work. Do you do it in the same way at Hive where you outsource all the stuff and you just have contracts in place and the people that uh, you employ are people managing these contracts, the same as Franco Nevada? Yep, we manage for software. And, and, and to share with you, we're the first, the first to balance the grid. Now, Riot does it on a big scale in Texas, but that model was first by what we were doing in northern Sweden. And we're very proud of that because we can go down in, in 15 seconds from 30 megawatts to three to allow the, ex, the electricity demand that's taking place in the community of Bowdoin and then quickly go back up. And it creates money for the community. It creates helps the utility company get a better return on their capital. And we've turned around and funded the hockey arena because hockey is everything in these areas. And we have 12 teams of kids that uh, we help fund and help the overall community. And it's called the Hive or Hockey Arena. Like soccer and rugby is so big in France. Uh, when it comes to Sweden, it's hockey. It's and hard in hard Texas, hard. where I live, it's football, but American football. And it's a recognize that you've got to have this community involvement. In Quebec, we took a building 
and repurposed it so that 40,000 square feet or 4,000 square meters approximately, where we do the Bitcoin mining using hydroelectricity, we heat and we have a radiator system in a building beside us five times bigger. And, and they make whirlpools there. And they have 170 workers making whirlpools for the Quebec uh, population. And it's all from the same molecule of electricity. So we've been innovators of never wasting energy and recycling it. So what you mean is that the molecule of electricity is used to mine and then uh, it's going to generate heat that you're going to use to heat and uh, so on. So it's like uh, a recycling, a very efficient way of recycling this molecule of energy and minimizing uh, the waste of electricity while securing the most decentralized uh, payment network on Earth, basically, right? Yes. And when you look at our, it's interesting, our, our market cap, um, You, I think you get the best value when you look at the, the, the market cap to Bitcoin produced. And we hold, by the way, we have over 2,600 Bitcoin on our balance sheet. So with Bitcoin at 70,000, that's almost worth 190, 100, yeah, 180 million dollars. Okay. So when you buy a hive, you're getting almost a dollar fifty, more than dollar fifty a share of uh, Bitcoin behind it, and and uh, so that's we believe is is the way we want to function for the shareholders. And uh, that's a question I'm being asked frequently: Bitcoin or Hive? What should investors buy, and why uh, one versus the other? You know, that's a great question. I, in the gold realm, I've always said that you should have the 10% golden rule as an alternative asset class, 5% into bullion and 5% into high quality gold stocks. And I've done a lot of quantitative analysis. I have a ETF in New York called Go Gold, uh, ticker is G-O-A-U, and it's quant driven and it outperforms uh, in that, uh, that methodology of picking gold stocks. When it comes to Bitcoin, I think you buy both. I think you buy uh, or you buy a fund. I've noticed a friend of mine have come up with a fund owning gold and Bitcoin. And that's because Paul Tudor Jones, the uh, multi-billion dollar hedge fund manager known for commodities, he recently said he owns both as alternative asset classes. I think that you you look at having some of these particular uh, ETFs and uh, and that you own an ETF that that owns the miners. Uh, I think that in Europe, it's very easy to go and buy, you know, like yourself, you have a product that I think is very, very helpful to own both. And what will happen over time, what's happened with gold stocks, when the GLD ETF came out in 2003, we saw a bifurcation that gold has outperformed most of the gold stocks, but it's not outperformed those gold stocks that have strong free cash flow yields, they've all performed. If we look at Franco Nevada, it went private and went public in 2008. Um, since 2008, it's more than doubled the performance of Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett. It, it, that, that they have an incredible business model. So I, I think you want to have both. And when Bitcoin is running, the miners will move more. You just have to recognize the volatility is about three to one, up and down. And you have to have the stomach to know the DNA of volatility. Over 10 days, the DNA of Bitcoin volatility versus, say, gold, and the DNA of a miner like Hive. So as Bitcoin rips, we outperform. Bitcoin goes through a correction, oh, we take it on the chin. We've got our boxing gloves up to protect. <laughs> Yeah, actually, I, I also spent a lot of time myself trying to answer this question by looking at gold and gold versus gold uh, miners. And, uh, and you have periods where uh, gold miners uh, overperform and underperform. I didn't know that when the gold ETF was launched, gold outperformed the gold miners. One thing I have also uh, got my head around is that when it comes to Bitcoin miners, if there's a huge rally, like people say about this Omega candle uh, where Bitcoin goes suddenly to 1 million, and uh, in that case, you're definitely much better holding a Bitcoin miner than holding Bitcoin because uh, 
the difficulty will not adjust as quick as the sharp rise uh, in price. So you have like a very nice space of a lot of profit for Bitcoin miners. So there's like a kind of optionality, you know, that comes where if it strikes very high, you're going to make a lot of money as a Bitcoin miner, much more than you would make just holding Bitcoin. Do you agree with this analysis? I, I, I just came out with it myself. I don't know if uh, you agree with it. I've done a lot of research on writing on it. And, and, um, and so a lot of mergers in 2003 to 2012, many gold mining companies kept buying each other and the, the, the merger valuations were never accreted on a per share basis. So the revenue grew, the production grew, but they issued so many shares to get that growth that on a per share basis, it actually declined. And, and in that math, it takes about nine months minimum up to 18 months to digest an acquisition that it shows up on a per share basis. And I've been very sensitive over how I look at gold stocks. And I think what's going to happen with these ETFs is there'll be a separation of those uh, uh, Bitcoin mining companies that have better discipline and financial metrics that we will outperform. And touch wood, you know, through all the crises, we've had operating income that's been positive. And, and so I can, uh, that's definitely not happened with our peers. We're just very frugal. We're very thoughtful. And uh, in how we are trying to manage the strategy for growth. Okay. And uh, also, when you compare it to gold, you have much better visibility as a bit as a gold miner on the gold price than a Bitcoin miner. And also, from my understanding, you correct me if I'm wrong, the uh, gold royalty model came out to allow the Bitcoin miners, the gold miners, to uh, hedge part of the risk, basically, by selling gold royalties to uh, financial investors. How do you see it going in the Bitcoin uh, mining world? I, because as a Bitcoin miner, I mean, if Bitcoin price drops significantly, you can be out of business. And we saw it in the last crypto winter. There's a lot of Bitcoin miners who went bust. And at the same time, you have you, they are all like trying, like yourself, to have like a minimum cost base so to minimize your operating cost, so you can uh, stay alive when uh, there are strong price adjustments. But at the same time, you cannot invest that much because you are afraid that there is this uh, price adjustment, and you don't have the gold royalty models where you have like the Bitcoin miners who are offsetting part of their risk to financial investors. Yeah, it's, it is different because gold doesn't rust in the ground. And, and when you're a big, and when you're like Franco Nevada, you are get looking for a 10 year payback, but geologically you think you have a 30 year life, maybe 40 year life. And as a royalty company, you get all of that free. And any expansion, you get free. So that's how royalty companies have been able to enjoy uh, so many projects coming on, like like the original Franklin Nevada was in uh, Nevada. And um, those gold mines have been going for 40 years. And, and they got their money back 30 years ago. And, and those mines have quadrupled their production. That's all free to them. You don't get that. The only way it'll happen here is if you have the source of energy. If you went and built a, a nuclear small micro reactor, et cetera, that, which is going to change. I believe it's going to change. I believe some big events happen this year. AWS owns by, owned by Amazon bought nuclear energy. And all the green anti-nuclear went quiet. Went quiet. And all of a sudden, there was a run to tie up energy. And they spent $650 million to buy almost a gigawatt of electricity stable electricity for their HPC data centers. Um, there's been a push now in the U.S. to have a, a the size of this cup. This will be the, like the nuclear source. And uh, these micro units uh, are, are very different and much easier and faster to build in areas. So I think we're going to see that change in America on, on the sort of growth of mini nuclear facilities and the a data center. So if you own one of those and you have the data center beside it, that will become 
your type of royalty model. When we look at the value of data centers, data centers forget just um, what miners are at. We're in the data center business, by the way, but just look at what they call a, a data center where people do co-hosting and co-location, et cetera. They trade at 22 times cash flow. That's that's like a royalty company because it's very stable long term. And and my goal is to get that for, for Hive. My goal is that we will go through this this journey of reposition in the minds and hearts of investors as a pretty stable data center business that has HPC. And over here, we also have Bitcoin mining, but really we're in the data center business. And that would really change the valuation metrics on Hive. Okay. But when you project yourself in the future of Hive, you see yourself doing both like HPC and Bitcoin mining, but isn't the future towards uh, specialization instead of diversification? And then you're going to have more specialized companies competing with you. How, how, how do you manage between diversification and specialization? I would say. Um, I, I would say that our, our big difference is, is that we're very good operators. I only use green energy. I think that uh, really shows up. And, and third part, when I look at the crypto mining space, we hodl. Those are making a big splash going into HPC. They don't hodl. It's just a source of cash flow. And, and they will slowly, it doesn't matter their size, go a different path. The big following really are Bitcoin industry. If, if, if you're functioning in financing and company, it's predominantly the retail in, investor that is really keen about Bitcoin mining. The institutions are more interested in the AI business or is the retail and the enthusiasm. And it reminds me of Apple. You know, Apple, when Steve Jobs was, was alive, it was very unique that people would buy his product and buy the stock too. And, and, and it showed up that the largest shareholders were brokers for retail customers. Okay. Uh, and, Interesting and, uh, comparison. And, and so you, you recognize that we have tens of thousands of retail investors. And at the same time, we have institutional investors, but it's recognizing the price, what they call the price discovery of a security. Uh, it's the minnows. And you don't attract a whale or a tuna or a shark, unless you have minnows. Okay. And since you have done the exercise on gold, how do you value a Bitcoin mining company? Because you can look at peers comparison, but that doesn't give you like a absolute value. And I tried to do the exercise and I struggled to find like what would be like you would value Apple or any other traditional business. I haven't found any uh, study yet that is convincing enough to value these businesses. I mean, if you look at just at MicroStrategy, how it's valued, I just like cannot, it's trading like two times or three times now, uh, it's book value. I, I looked a lot at Franco Nevada actually because they trade at a book value premium because people believe they can extract much more from uh, their gold and what they really have valued on their accounts as assets. But uh, in uh, Bitcoin miner space and uh, micro strategies, even like a better example, you have like exact precise uh, value of what is the value of the assets. And, uh, and these uh, ASICs uh, trade and uh, uh, you know exactly what they were. So so how would you value a Bitcoin miner? Uh, it's a good question. I, I, I think that w you look at the hodl position and you back out what the valuation is per exahash. So what are you paying for that exahash, the market cap? So to sell one to buy the other is basically to be, har to be harvesting who gives you <clears throat> the best bang for the amount of exahash they're producing. And you can see these rotations that all of a sudden this stock gets, gets so much enthusiasm. Everyone's driving into this name. It's got all this market awareness and social media, et cetera. And the valuations become greatly exaggerated. And then all of a sudden 
it started being sold down the other one. So the dynamic process so often in the gold space, I'll share with you, if you're a gold stock picker, you have to have 20 names in a gold fund to have a minimum. But if you just took the 20 names and bought the highest change in revenue per share year over year, you'll perform everybody. Oh. <laughs> it's just revenue. Market okay. goes to revenue. So, oh, market, so the extra hash is the revenue proxy, basically. It's the proxy for your Bitcoin footprint. And so you okay, look at that. So you have to look at the, the total position that you're getting per share or per market cap. Mm. So for every Bitcoin divided by market cap, are you getting mm. best value? If you go by, say, HUT8, you're paying $200 million for an exahash. You buy Hive, you're paying $40 million. Simple. It, it, that, that, that's the, uh, the ratio difference. Uh, why did HUD 8 go up so much this year? Because it went into the Russell 2000 index. Had nothing to do with them having great revenue growth per share. It didn't had nothing to do with cash flow. It had to do with a one-year event on the index. Okay. So, I see. so you'll see that all of a sudden it becomes a spike, then it's going to correct. The same thing happens in, 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 in this industry. So always look for the first mover advantage is to look for who has the greatest revenue per share momentum? The market pays you for that. And then who actually delivers? Where, where today are you getting the best value? Of, and trying to gauge Bitcoin with the price of Bitcoin in the model makes it very difficult. So the easier way is to look at the exahash. Okay. And what about consolidation? I haven't seen any of all these listed Bitcoin miners uh, consolidating, although they are, have been like in business for years now and there's it's very still few uh, m a going on compared to what you have seen, uh, like you described in the gold uh, miners industry. How yeah, do you explain it, it, that? It's still young. I think that um, Riot went after Bit Farms on a hostile and, um, and, and they didn't really pay enough. That's what I think. So it just if you want to do what's accretive, then they would have had to pay a higher price for what Biff Farms has uh, because on a relative basis, it was undervalued to riot. In the gold mining industry, price is everything on those acquisitions. So if you don't offer something attractive, I think what will happen is you'll start seeing some acquisitions and what they'll offer, what they were doing in, in Canada, the gold mining industry, going back, I got to age myself now, like the, in two, two from 2001 to 2010, there was lots. Of, there were several deals that came out where they offer you also a warrant, so people couldn't go short long your stock uh, in that arbitrage. So you, you, I'd offer to take you over, and I'm going to pay a 30 percent premium with my stock for your stock plus a warrant. Okay. So if if they go to just say short my stock to go long that stock, well, they may not get the warrant. So then. All of a sudden, what is the time value? I mean, applying Black Shoals model, uh, what is the value of that? That hasn't happened yet, but it will. It's still a young industry. Yeah, so hopefully, maybe for the next bull run, uh, we'll yep. see some more uh, going on. And we're excited that we came out yesterday with Cantor Fitzgerald, who's in Europe, came out with a $9 target price for Hive. So we're getting some you know, positive recommendations and news around the our company and 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 we're very happy with sort of that institutional support because there's no retail following with Cantor Fitzgerald but they're great at creating ETFs they're they were you know very much involved in the creation of several most of these ETFs going back 20 years ago Cantor was a big funder of the initial capital to go and they also do a lot of the funding for the crypto mining company so I, I think the fact that they're now covering us is very positive for our shareholders. Okay, uh, maybe one last question since uh, it's not often that I have a gold bug uh, <laughs> on the show. I wanted to understand like from a cultural perspective, I mean, gold is very big in uh, North America, but uh, is completely inexistent in Europe. And uh, the only explanation I have had so far is because uh, Nixon sees the gold from uh, Europeans uh, in the 70s. They kind of didn't have any more gold to get interested in, And it kind of like phased out 
from uh, European portfolios. And I see the same happening on Bitcoin, although there is no uh, technical uh, parallel between two, like anybody can go and buy Bitcoin. But you see a huge difference between North America's adoptions, even before the ETF, even like on the private uh, metrics, like uh, the US elections is almost driven by crypto now, where in uh, Europe, it's like uh, much lagging. So where do you think this comes from? I think it's culture. You got to think that it's a country that has incredible deep pockets of different industries. And it's hard for me coming from Canada, moving to the U.S., Canada is one-tenth the size. Canada is not as capitalistic as America is, free markets. Europe is even further behind and more socialistic. Socialists do not, they want centralized control of anything monetary. And that's always the big idea in the fight. So when we look at Switzerland, very powerful cantons, the, the, the states are like in America, they have tremendous t tax powers. They have their own quasi constitution. T Texas does not have an income tax. California has a big income tax. They, they compete with each other within America competing against the rest of the world. Switzerland is the only country I know in Europe that does that. Uh, and you can see that it's a mechanism of a decentralized thought process versus centralized. Well, when we talk about the world of gold uh, in, in a centralized world, well, actually, they don't like gold and they don't try to support that you, that gold represents freedom and gold represent, is portable wealth. When you leave that, and I've characterized this in all my writings, there's two types of trades. There's the fear trade, which dominates gold demand in America and central banks. There's the love trade, which is dominated in Asia and the Middle East. So what do I mean by the love trade is that in, in the love trade is the people in with the 12 year uh, calendar um, of like from shamanism in Asia, that if you're born in the year of the tiger, uh, you will get a gold tiger, 24 karat gold tiger. Uh, you go to all the jewelry stores in Singapore, you land there, you'll see gold tigers that year. Last year was the year of the rabbit. And, and you just witnessed this sort of love for giving gold. All the Vietnamese people that got out early as boat people had a what's called a gold tail, a gram of gold. That's how they got out. When we look at the research with Syrians that were able to escape first, it was gold. They took off their gold bangles. They got out first. So they, they wear their love. They wear their jewelry. Indian women wear six times the amount of gold that's in Fort Knox. So what you've seen is the correlation for the love trade is GDP per capita. And what we have witnessed in the past 24 years, this century, is this huge growth in GDP per capita, first with China, then India, and now China and India neck and neck, this big growth. Well, they're 40% of the world's population, and they buy gold for love. They buy it for their family. They buy for birthdays, they, for wedding season, for um, calendar holidays, calendar birthdays. So you have this big bid. Every time gold is sold off, a big bid comes in, and it's predominantly the love trade, highly correlate the GDP per capita. Fear trade is 40% of the gold demand. And, and that's what we're seeing with central banks around the world uh, of concern of this, what they call MMT, modern monetary theory, mm -hmm. of this massive money printing, and they've gone to gold. Now we have the BRICS being formed, and the BRICS want to take on the dollar. And what do they have to get to, to have any valid validity is to own gold. So they've been big buyers of gold, but it's not really going to work because their currencies are not fungible. China doesn't accept American Express, MasterCard, or Visa. It's a controlled society. Russia has basically imposed their own control. They don't have social media like we have open uh, skies in, in Europe and in North America. They don't have open banking system. So they keep buying gold to try to get the credibility. And that all comes with that fear trade thought process. Bitcoin comes along and it's much more about the individual freedom. The, this, the growth of Tether is much more about the individual freedom, much more about that inclusive discussion that's necessary for people to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
Okay, interesting. Did that insight. help you, or did I confuse you? <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, interesting. I haven't thought about it uh, that way, from especially the socialistic part and the centralized versus decentralized type of countries. And there is a strong correlation between Bitcoin adoption and decentralized uh, governments and uh, cantons. Like you said, in fact, Switzerland, I've been like never understood why there's such a big, there's a crypto valley, actually, the plan B was in Lugano, and and Lugano has been very big on, uh, you can pay your taxes and Bitcoin and uh, so on. Very, yeah. very, very interesting insight. I, we're going to have to wrap it up. Unfortunately, you, it was friend. a very nice uh, discussion. Uh, and meet I you. hope to see you soon on the show again. Yes, and, and uh, go to usfunds.com and get our research. And we also have on Hive's website, um, in French, the uh, explaining the FUD of energy, of how much energy is being consumed by Bitcoin mining. It's all wrong. All the data Michael Saylor had organized, all the miners put in their data and came out that we use less than the gold mining or the banking industry. But we've taken 30 minutes to three minutes, and it's in French, it's in Spanish, it's in English, and it's in Swedish. Okay, I'll have a look at it and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll just do. If Thanks you need it, just call my office. Frank, nice to Thank see you. Thank you. Bye.